Right, what we've got on our hands here is a perfectly normal, yet extraordinarily dull text field. And look, it's asking for help. It wants us to make it look more interesting. But well, fortunately for it, we're in the business of making things look awesome by putting in a shadows on them. So as you can see, I've pulled in the extension that we wrote for the text inner shadows for two reasons. Firstly, I want to steal that function signature, but I also thought it would be instructive to be able to compare and contrast the two implementations since they are different. So the first thing I'm going to do is copy this extension and make it an extension on view. So we duplicate that and then we make that one an extension on view and we go up here and immediately use it. And now you can see why I've got two paddings on there. I'm going to use the nice background that we've got up there. And now we run into the first difference. You see, when you're putting inner shadows on text, it doesn't need to know what shape it's got to be because it's the shape of the text. The answer is in the question. However, a view has no intrinsic knowledge of its shape. So when you make a view a circle, you do that by clipping it to a circle. You're basically clipping it or masking it to different shapes so the view itself doesn't actually have any knowledge of what shape it is. We need to tell it on which canvas we need to paint this inner shadow. And we do that by passing in a shape as well. So the inner shadow extension on view is going to be generic not only on view, but also on shape, like this. S is going to be a shape. And we say the shape is of type S. And now we can put in a capsule. And then we resume. So let's just move this up so we can see the differences. And already there's something happening, but that implementation is not going to help us here. So I'm going to get rid of all of this and we're going to start just from self. When we put an inner shadow on text, we went up the way by using the overlay modifier. In this one, we're going to be going down the internal Z index by using the background modifier. So the first thing we're going to do is put a background of the background. Background, background. And there we have my favorite linear gradient on there. And now is the next departure from the text implementation in that we are going to put the blend mode on next. We sandwich the blend mode between the background and the shadow implementation, which is going to come underneath it. So we apply the background to the shadow with the blend mode of multiply. So we say blend mode multiply. And then we put another background on, and this is going to be our Z stack. So I'm just going to copy this bit. I'm going to get rid of that, stick in the Z stack there. Now the foreground color isn't helping us here, and we're going to use the fill of the shape. That is after all the shape that we want to put the shadow on. So instead of self foreground color, we're going to use shape.fill. And we can just do this. Shape. Fill. And then we're going to need to tell it that that is a color. There we go. So we're almost there. The last thing we need to do is clip this thing to get rid of that extra background that we can see. So the final step is going to be clip shape, shape. And there we are. We've got our beautiful looking text box. And if we play, the crucial thing here is that we are still able to interact with it. Yes, we can. This is the reason that we have gone into the background in this one, because if we'd gone in the overlay direction, we wouldn't have been able to interact with this control. Now let's do that test that we did for the text, whereby we put a dark background on it and see if that affects the shadow in any way. So let's go down here and after the greedy frame, put on a background, the color of white 0.1 and we're going to ignore safe areas. Houston, we have a problem. Although the shadow colors haven't been affected by this, that white blur is escaping. This is actually a bug. As you can see, we've got a clip shape there on line 33, which should be controlling this. The reason I know this is a bug is because there are two ways of fixing it. And the first way of fixing it would be to make S an insettable shape. So let's do that. 
and see what happens. And then for the shape itself, we can inset it by 0 0.01, very, very tiny amount. And because we've changed the function signature, we need to resume. But look at that. I've inset it by 0 0.01, and it's perfect. In other words, it just needed a bit of coaxing. So this is definitely a bug, but it is one that we have worked around here. But now we've restricted ourselves to only being able to deal with insettable shapes. When we're actually putting in a shadows on shapes, I don't want to be just dealing with insettable shapes, so we need another workaround. So let's put that back to shape. And instead of clip shape, we're going to use a mask. We say mask, shape, and this also will not work. And it won't work because when you're dealing with mask, there's a slightly different problem. We have to tell it that the shape we're going to mask with is restricted to the view. And we do that by saying self overlay and we pass in the shape. It does mean that we do have a mask in there, but it's only one. So we're not going to suffer too much from a performance point of view. And look, we can even change the frame. We can change it to a rectangle a lovely inner shadow on a rectangle. Or we could say a rounded rectangle with a corner radius of 20. And doesn't that look lovely? But let's move on to putting an extension on a shape. So we're going to build on this extension. In fact, we're going to use exactly the same extension, but we're going to call it from an extension on shape. First thing we do, let's copy this extension. Duplicate that. And we'll make it an extension on shape. And since we are a shape, we don't want to be passing in the shape that we want our inner shadow to conform to, because we are defining that. We are the shape. And all we're going to do is call the view extension and pass us as the shape, which looks like this. Inner shadow, and we pass in the background. We pass in ourselves. We pass in the radius the opacity and the offset. And now we're ready to go. Let's resume. Now for this, to make things a bit more interesting, I want to use our own shape just to show that this will work with any shape. I'm going to create a shape which is a triangle here. And using layout guides, this is going to be very, very quick. Let's put it here. This is going to be an equilateral triangle. And I'm going to create a layout guide here of type polar in that rectangle with one ring and three segments. I move to the top, I draw a line to 1, 1. I draw another line to 1, 2. And then I close the subpath. And we're done. If you're new to layout guides, they're a part of Pure Swift UI, and I've done a whole series on them, so give them a look. You won't be disappointed. So now I can use that up here. So instead of all of this, I can say triangle in a shadow with a nice background on it and resume. There we have our lovely inner shadow, except no, we don't. Remember that we are going into the background here. So we're putting a background on the shape, essentially, in this case. But when you don't put a fill on a shape, it automatically gets set to the foreground color. We need to deal with that in our shape extension. So before we call in a shadow, what we have to do is set the fill color to clear. We do that like this down here. Fill color clear. And then we call the inner shadow. So we can change that and put the radius on, make it say, make it 10. But I think this nice background has run its course. I think we need something a bit more interesting in there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in the settings icon that we developed in the, wait for it, the settings icon episode. And I'm going to replace our nice background with the settings icon. And I'm also going to give it a frame of 400. Now, as you can see, it's gone really dark. And the reason it's gone really dark is because the settings icon itself has a background layer on it, which is the background color of the icon. Now, if we don't do anything about it, it's also going to participate in the blend mode of multiply and make everything very dark indeed. 
So we need to rasterize it before it gets to that stage, and the way we do that is by putting it in a drawing group. So we say, drawing group. Now that has gone gray. Obviously this isn't what we want, and this is a bug in Xcode, because the preview on a Mac Mini, where I do my screen recordings, doesn't work. On the MacBook Pro, the preview does work, so it's a bit of a quirky one. So what I'm going to do from this point forward is replace the preview area with what I've got on my external device, which will show it up nicely. Let's increase the opacity of that shadow and give it a direction. So I'm going to say, opacity is one, and the offset is a point three comma three. All right, that gives our shadow a bit of direction because I want to animate the shape itself and show you that this inner shadow will maintain its direction regardless of whether or not the shape it's being applied to is rotating. So instead of text, let's put in rotating state variable like this. Rotating false. We'll put an on appear modifier in and say with animation animation linear with the duration of 10, repeat forever with an auto reverse of false, rotating equals true. And then we say rotate if we're rotating minus 360 degrees. And then since we've changed a property, we need to resume. And there we are. And the direction of the inner shadow remains constant. Now, before we stop, I want to show you something that you may not be aware of with shapes, partly because you may not know it, and partly because it looks cool. You can actually stroke a shape and then use that stroke as another shape. But in order for this to work, I need to increase the size of the settings icon manually, so it's not constrained by the size of the triangle. So I'm going to make its size explicitly 400. And now what I can do is put a stroke on this with just a line width, not a background. And then I take the frame, subtract two times the line width from the original, and we get 280. And there we are. I'm now using the stroke of the shape as the shape that I'm using to put an inner shadow on with a background just like this. So now I can go down here, get rid of this, and look at that, it's like it's cut out of our view with this mechanical Doctor Who-like thing going on there. Fantastic. Right, we've almost completed our Inner Shadows journey, and in the last episode we're going to be putting Inner Shadows on images, where we use the transparency of the image to drive the shadow itself. So join me for that, it's going to be brilliant. And if you don't want to miss it, consider subscribing. And if you like what's going on, don't forget to hit the thumbs up, it really helps the channel to reach other people. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. See you next time. <laughs>